Well, yeah, good morning, everybody. Boy, it's good, good morning, to see you here. Uh, how many of you here today in the room would, would say that you are an average person? No, there's not an average person. No, you, you aren't average. No, I know all that good. You're something, but you ain't average. <laughs> Uh, nobody wants to go to an average church or be in an average family. We want to be in a family that is unique and has you know, qualities that people admire and like and want to be like. Um, do you ever listen to the Prairie Home Companion? That's one of my favorite things to do on Saturday night. I love Garrison Keeler. And uh, it's on the radio, by the way. That's that little box that doesn't have a picture. <laughs> I don't know if somebody knew what I was talking about. Anyway, uh, Garrison, he's on there, and he's he'll, he'll say he talks about Lake Wobegon, you know, which and Lake Wobegon. He said, and all the children are above average. So there's not an average kid in the whole town, and that's true. But there's no no such thing as an average kid. I've often told you here at the Cowboy Church that uh, we we all think of ourselves as average. We do, and that's because we're average Americans, we're average Midwesterners, we're average Missourians. Uh, we think of ourselves as that, but when we think about Christianity and following the Lord, I, I want you to realize that we're not, that, that normal is not average. We are, our culture today is sub-normal. We are so below in our walk with the Lord. We, we don't pray like we, people prayed in generations back, past. We don't attend church like people did in generations past. We don't read our Bible. We're too distracted by entertainments and activities. And uh, we're, we're distracted by wealth and materialism. We have slipped way down on the average scale of following the Lord. I'm just saying, if you're like everybody else around you, you're not normal. All right? The normal Christians were better than we. We need to, we need to remember that and, scoot, and choose to live higher, closer to the Lord. Today we're going to be looking at the book of Ephesians. We're in the fourth chapter today. And I, I chose this little short inter, interlude in our, our studies because I want to go back and encourage you and me to do more, to do more, uh, to do better with the Lord, to strive harder, to, to reach higher. Sometimes we get settled in. I know summers get so busy. We've been bailing hay for three weeks, seems like, and, and uh, we have had we're going from daylight to dark, and and it's uh, it's busy. And you know, you know, you all are that way. We don't have time, seems like, for the things that are important for family, for prayer, for for you know, just the Lord. And we need to remember that during this summertime, we can focus on the Lord. We don't need to be distracted like we've been. So let's. I want to encourage us today to to get back to the Lord this summer and get closer to Him. Now the Cowboy Church, I don't believe, has reached its full potential yet. We've been going at this, what, seven or eight years now? I, I kind of lose track. But I don't, we've not reached our full potential. Uh, we we still have a lot of people that need the Cowboy kind of church. to kind of They need to hear about the Lord uh, like we talk about Him here and like we believe and how we serve Him and worship Him. And so we've not reached our full potential, but I think we can in the next few years. I think we can, can stretch, strive, and stretch and become what God really dreamed for this Cowboy Church to be. It has done fantastic. Thank you so much for helping us be a part of this. You've made a tremendous church. Now, when I talk today about how to make this a better church, and that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk about how to make this a better church. I'm not going to talk about the building I'm not going to talk about the organization. I'm not talking about the preaching or the music. I'm talking about you. How can you make this a better church and reach our maximum potential? What What is it that you could do better, that you could expand and reach stretch harder? What could you do to make yourself and this church a better church is what we're going to look at today. We're in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and I want to jump in in verse 1 and tell you that the most important thing any of us can do this summer is surrender ourselves to the whole, to the leadership of God. When I say surrender, I mean like turn yourself in. You know, stop running from the law, from the Lord. Turn yourself in. Surrender. Now, Paul, who wrote this today, was a prisoner. He knew. He understood being in jail. He understood 
being in confinement, he was surrendered to that prisoner, to that prison. He couldn't, he couldn't uh, do what he wanted to do. He couldn't eat when he wanted to eat. He couldn't drink when he wanted to drink. He couldn't uh, change clothes when he wanted to change clothes or watch the TV programs he wanted to watch. He was in jail. He couldn't do anything except what the jailers told him to do. He was a prisoner. And I thought, you know, we today need to stretch back to that in, in, as we follow the Lord. We need to let Him have more leadership in our life, more power, and be surrendered to Him. So I'm going to talk about surrendering to the Lord and how that works. If you will, please read along with me here in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Let me stop just a moment and define a few churchy words that we throw around. Churches are, we're real bad, and preachers are real bad about churchy language. We say words and we think everybody knows what we mean. So let me define a few words today. And I want to talk about the word calling. You have been a call, you've been called. I've been called. We have, we all have a calling. What does that mean? What is calling? It simply means this. God has made available to you and to me he said, I want you to come be my children. I want to be your father. I want you to be my children. I want you in my family. And I'm calling you from all over the world. Every race, tribe, ethnicity, everywhere. I'm calling you in. And I want you all to come and be my children. Live with me. Love me. Learn my way. Study my law. I'm calling you into me. You've all been called. We have this calling. Paul says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You have been called. Uh, you say, well, you know, I've never, I never heard God call me. He's never picked up the phone or, or ho hollered at me. Uh, I've never heard Him. Well, you don't hear God with your ears. Now, I'm sure you could. God was, is capable of speaking in our ears. But He primarily speaks into our inner person. He speaks into our subconscious almost as He draws us in the, the directions He wants to draw us. It's not a push. God's not a, He's a gentleman. He doesn't push, but He beckons and He draws. And He says, you know, come on, come on, this try it'll be okay to come my way. But but He never demands it. You know, sometimes as a father or a grandfather, I demand things of my children. And I try the, the candy and the sweet talk, you know. When that doesn't work, I paddle our little behinds. <laughs> Right. God doesn't paddle our behinds. He draws us. He calls us. So look, you got that. Let's keep going. It says, let me start over. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. And then he says, verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, we, we Paul used a lot of words here to describe this surrendering thing. So I want to try to just take these words and let you look at them and see how they fit you. He says, first of all, be worthy. And it means, this means the one who is worthy of the call of God. And, and that worthiness, it helps us keep our life in balance or whatever. Or, or God says, I've, been, I've, been call, I've called you to let your walk match your talk. In other words, it balances our life. You, you're worthy. He wants you to be worthy uh, of the calling. Now then we talked about the calling. Let's look at the word humility. This is a big word. If we're going to be the church that we need to be here at Sock River Cowboy Church, here in the stockyards, if we need to be, if we're going to be the church God put us to be, we have to understand humility. And I think it's easier for farmers and cowboys and ruralists to understand humility. We're not into the big showy stuff. Oh, we like a good horse and a good dog and a good tractor and you know a car and a truck or whatever. We like that. But we're we're more into we're more humble folks, farmers and ranchers and. There is a little bit of humility there, but sometimes we can get prideful about our humility. Oh, have you read the new book I'm going to come out with? Humility and How I Achieved It? I'm going to be writing that book for a while. You can get a copy of it. But we, we have to be careful because we need to be humble. What does humility mean? Let me read it. Pride promotes disunity. Humility promotes unity. Mm. If you are a disruptor of unity, you can bet your pride is the cause. Humble people are agreeable people and God gets the glory. Humble people cause unity. How does that work? See, here, here's how this works. People who are not humble, they think they deserve 
different things, different quality of, of life. They deserve that you serve them better because you know I pay you to do this, so I you owe me. You know we feel like we're, we we deserve it. Sometimes we go to a restaurant and and the waitress might be a little slow getting our second glass of tea there, and we get all bent out of shape because we think well, blah, 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 blah. and we we think we're so entitled to everything. We need to humble ourselves and remember we are the servants. We are the servants. Servants humble themselves and serve. And, and I think we often get that a little out of shape. But if we at the Cowboy Church can really become humble, we can not, not false humility, but real humility, we can be a people that, that will draw folks to the Lord here through just plain humbleness. Now, some people think humility is weakness. If I'm humble, that just shows weakness. Let me tell you something. It takes more strength right. to be humble than it does any of it to, to do anything else. You can, if you're weak, you cannot be humble. I think a lot of people who are weak have problems with their pride, but they got it all messed up because it takes great strength to humble oneself. Your most powerful people can be humble. And if you're having trouble with that, you, you need to think about that and understand it. It's not weakness, it's strength. And then there's the word gentleness. I mean, we get all these words that kind of fit together. Gentleness, humility. Let's talk about gentleness for just a moment. This is the opposite of self-assertion. Now see, uh, somebody who puts themselves into everything, that's not gentle. It, it says, you, you know, I don't, have my, I don't have my emotions under control. And I flare out at this person, I flare out at that person. That person is not gentle. A gentle person has emotions under control and knows how to, to use them, when to keep them quiet. I, when I think about gentleness, I tell you, I got the craziest idea about gentleness, and that's from an elephant. An ele have you ever been around him much? An elephant is a very gentle animal. Huge, powerful, but they're very gentle. Watch them with their babies. They'll, a whole herd will walk by a bunch of babies, and they'll move, they won't step on it. And the horse is about the same way around babies. I don't worry about my... Uh, sometimes they will. But mostly, the elephant will never step on other babies. They're very gentle with them. And again, nothing stronger. So, if we want to be a better church, we have to become humble and gentle with people. How, how do we express a lack of gentility? Well, I came to church this morning and there's a pickup sitting right where I park every time. That's my parking place. Everybody knows that. What's wrong with these people? Well, I sit in that chair. That's my chair. And so, you know, I came to church this morning. Was, there's somebody already in my place. Folks, we need to be humble and gentle with folks. And, and make sure we, we love others more than we love ourselves. Now, there's one more word that Paul uses. And I'm going to get on it and then we'll move on. And that is the word patience. Mm, patience. We just... Uh, patience is the spirit which never gives up. Let me talk about this. Often I think patience is, oh, I'm waiting for this, I'm waiting for this. But it's, it's a patience just hangs on and never gives up. It just keeps humble, being humble. It just keeps being gentle. It just keeps on, keeps on, keeps on. An old preacher I used to know say, he just keep on keeping on. That's what he said. It just keeps on coming. And so be patient. It takes patience to make a marriage work. Check your head like this. Yeah, just hang on. <laughs> I was standing there yesterday. I had, I had three weddings in just the last short amount of time. And, and I was standing there with a couple. This weekend, I won't tell you which one. And I was standing there and I, and I told them my story. I tell you all the time. I said, you know what love is? I said, love's not this picture. I said, love's not the picture of you standing here under this beautiful bunch of flowers. That's, not, that's love, but it's not the kind of love I'm talking about. I said, love is the 80-year-old man feeding the 80-year-old woman in the nursing home oatmeal. That's love. That's love. That's when I mean that's real stuff. I mean that's the hard. That's that's a, you know that's a construction grade love. It's not easy cheap stuff. Love tough. So we need to be surrendered to the Lord, patient, and just never, never, ever give up. Well, now the next thing I'm going to talk about is this thing called unity. Now, unity. Getting us together with one mind. Bringing us together with one purpose. 
you see, if we if we come to church, let's just say we had seven or eight hundred of us here that gather on a Sunday morning, and uh, that's about what we run, some six, seven to, to, to eight, and, and let's say some Sunday we get that many folks here, and let's say some come. Well, I want to go because I want uh, I, I've got a business in the area, and I want those farmers to trade with me. <laughs> some people come just to get business. That's your purpose. Some people think I'm going to go down and see if I find me a good looking woman. <laughs> Or I'm going to get me a man. Right? That's two purpose. That's your purpose. We've got business and you got, you know, you want to find somebody to, to live with. That's two purposes. Well, think of the purposes that we have. And if we come all with our unique purpose, or I, I love this one. I, I came because my mother made me. But that We get all these purposes going in going to church. They're, they're not unified. We're going in... 35 different directions. We're going sometimes seven, 800 different directions at one time. Because everybody comes with a different reason, a different purpose. But folks, when a church, when seven, 800 people get unified around the power of God and about worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, and we come here for one purpose with humility, patience, and gentleness and all that, but we come for one thing, we can become the most powerful unity on planet Earth. Amen. We can turn this country upside down for Jesus and this church will reach its full potential in a very short amount of time when we could get unified and humble and, and patient and all those good things. Let's read verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. You see, it's all about Jesus. Let's just look at these beautiful words here. Make every effort. Make every effort to keep the unity through the bond of peace. Make every effort. That should be the primary goal that you bring to, with you to church. I'm going to do everything within my power to keep the unity through the bond of peace in this body of believers. Everything I've got. That's, that's why I've come here. I'm going to do everything I can to make peace. That's what you should be thinking when you come and so if somebody sits in your chair, or so if somebody gets the kind of donut you wanted to get, and there's just one left, and somebody got it. Well, okay. Keep the bond of the unity of peace in love. Let's be loving people and share the fruit of And then let's keep going. See, then he says there's one, there's one spirit. And then he begins to tell you all about, about the oneness of the church. We are one in Christ. We've got one hope. We have one Lord. We have one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And then Christ is in us all, all over us, we're in Him, and it's all, it's all one. We're one. And so we have to make this work one body. And so we're not divided. We don't worship three or four gods. We worship one God. Now, another way for a church to become disunified is for them to worship more than one God. And who is that other God? that I'll tell you about, that we get to worshiping so often. Who's that other God? Ourselves. Us. Mm -hmm. Us, ourselves, our pride, our ego. But if we come humble, gentle, and patient, and we come and we worship one Lord, folks, we create something so powerful. This world's never seen anything quite like it. Right. Now, God is unifying the universe in physics. He's pulled it all together. He's unifying the planet in, in the relationships and He's unifying His church. He's pulling it all together under one faith, one Lord. He's going to make that all happen. I know right now it's a complicated planet we live on. There's so many different ideas. There's so many different directions, thoughts. Uh, and, I, and people are going and, and, and worshiping in so many different ways and so many different gods. But there will be a day. You remember this. You remember it one day. You say, well, I remember now. Look how what church preacher said that. There will be a day when every knee will bow, right. every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. There's one day that day. It's coming. It's coming. Get ready for it. There's going to be that day. Have you ever studied another world religion? Any other world religions? They're complicated. I mean, you've got to do this, and then you've got to do that. And I mean, it's so complicated. I don't, I don't think I'm smart enough to be a nothing else but a Christian. I'm just because it's so simple. I love the Lord Jesus. He saved me. He loves me. That's all. He's forgiven me. 
Now the Jewish religion, it got so complicated that from it went from Ten Commandments to nearly 250 or 300 different rules and commandments. It got so complicated that when Jesus came, He said, this is killing you. You need to remember, love God with all your heart and your neighbors yourself. See, Jesus told us that. We serve one Lord. One Lord. Now, the last thing I want to say today is that we need to keep our heart open and spread grace around. If we want to be the cowboy church that reaches the maximum potential and we become the church that turns this whole area around for the Lord, and we can do that. In fact, we're already beginning to do that. But within the next few years, we can see this reach an unbelievable pinnacle if we can keep our hearts open and spread grace. Let me read you the text and then we'll talk about it. But to each, verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Let me tell you about me. I'm a little country boy, mean as the devil. I grew up just a little country boy, running up down the creeks and gathering ticks and chitters out in the woods. That's what I did for a living. <laughs> and uh, anything you could do, Henri and me, we tried it and did it. I grew up, married a beautiful woman, went to college and, and uh, raised a family. I'm still not perfect. I still mess up, have bad thoughts. I'm a sinner. Anybody in here besides me? I'm a sinner. Once in a while I mess up, say a bad word even yet. I ain't proud of it. But I'll, you know, it'll happen. I'll slip up. A wrench, I'll be pulling on a boat and I'll slip and mash my hand. I'll say, oh my goodness, thank you. <laughs> I don't. I'm a country boy. I learned all those words as a young person. <clears throat> but to each one of us, grace has been given. Yes. What does that mean? God likes me and you just like I am. He's forgiven my sins. He accepted me. He brought me into His family. He said, I want you to be mine. I want you to be one of my kids. And I said, I want you to be my daddy. And we were family together. And he loved me even though I'm a no good, honorary little kid. There was. Now I'm an old man. I'm wore out. Old man. But God loves me just like I am. He loves me. And he loves the same thing. Loves you the same way. And that's called grace. Now, grace is not just one directional. We think of grace coming down from God. It comes down one directional. It just comes down to us. Grace is not one directional. Grace is multi-directional. It comes down to us and it flows from us to everybody else. I have to give grace just like I've been getting grace. God forgave me, a no good, worthless person. And so I have to forgive you, a no good, worthless person. I have to forgive you too. Don't you? All right. Let me talk to you just in closing, but I want to tell you how what God had to go through. Come with me. I mean, you're going to have to stretch your imagination as far as it's stretch right now. Imagine an unimaginable place called heaven. It has existed always. It has never not been. It didn't have a beginning. But it blows my mind right there. But it never had a beginning. It will never have an ending. But it has always existed. And God is the center of it. God is it. He is that. Everything else is an expression of Him. But He's always man. And He lives in this magnificent place of light and beauty and power. Power to build universes with a word. Power, beauty, perfection. And that's where God's lived always. I have to use a human word to describe that. Then one day he looked down at a dusty little rock, three rocks out from the sun, three third rock from the sun. He looked down and saw this little earth we live on, and he saw you and me and living on it and doing what we do. And he said, I love those people. I made them, I created them, I love them. I love them. Don't know why I love them. We don't deserve it, but He loves us. So God, living in that perfection, beauty, and power, began to reduce Himself and begin to shrink. Think about this now. He began to condescend. He left that. He began to change. And He began to descend. He, he came down to the beauty of heaven. He got smaller and smaller and less powerful and weaker. And then finally he came, he came all the way down to a barn in Bethlehem in cow poop and flies and stink. And he was born there 
and they swaddled him with clothes that they used to wipe off animals with. And that's where he landed. He came from that to this. And then we think, well, that's as far down as you can get in it. Uh -uh. He, he kept going. He kept going down. For 33 years, he went down. For 33 years, he descended, was, was spit upon, was <laughs> accused, was laughed at, was scorned, was rejected. And finally, he went all the way down to the cross. We nailed him on a, on a tree and watched him die and laughed at him. And he, he wasn't done yet. He descended even further. Went down into a grave and stayed there for three days in the dark. Three days, but that's as far down as he got. Hallelujah. That's as far down as he went. And from then on, he's been going back up. He arose from the grave. He arose and he went back up into that majesty of heaven. And now listen, he sits up there and he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he rules the whole thing. That's what he did. Listen to me for you and for me. And He spread grace to us as He came by. And now, it's your job. Your job to spread grace. You're going to have to descend. Come on. Stay with me. You're going to have to do some humility. You're going to have to do some meekness, some gentleness. You're going to have to do some patience. You're going to have to descend. Come off your high horse is what I'm trying to say. You're going to have to descend. It's okay to get your hands dirty to spread grace. It's okay to be born in a barn to spread grace. You're going to have to have a little poop to spread grace. See, that's the way this works. We spread grace around. But as we spread it around, then it starts raising and it gets exalted and it ascends. And grace spreads, grace spreads to this, grace spreads to that one, and it all starts rising. And a culture begins to rise, an area, and then a culture. And we change everything, and everything ascends back to the glory of God. That's how our cowboy church reaches its maximum potential when it spreads grace. Folks, start being more graceful. Love people. When you get mad at somebody, remember, well, that's probably I do the same thing. In other words, stop, stop being so entitled, so arrogant, and love people. Love people. And we'll change this world for Jesus.